Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Tuesday, April 30th edition of the Basement Academy. And before we dive into uh, some more observations and reflections on the Sunday afternoon meeting with the discernment team, I thought I would read a psalm. And I think it's a psalm that, that speaks, you know, I had that funeral on, uh, on Monday, and so thoughts and prayers for the Reagan family. But Psalm 90 on day 30, I love it. It's the end of the month. And so there's kind of a, this wider lens that the psalmist, uh, this is attributed to Moses, that Moses gives us the, the eternal perspective from everlasting to everlasting uh, God. But then the reality of the, the brevity, the, the number of our days. And so let me, let me offer this prayer as we wrap up the month, as we think of the Reagan family and others. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men, for a thousand years in your sight, or like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath, we finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger, for your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Hmm. Don't know if Moses wrote that at some point in the wilderness wanderings as he saw people dying and dying, <laughs> returning to dust as they were buried, and Israel kept moving on towards the promised land. Anyway, so I, I commend Psalm 90 to you. Okay, some observations, reflections uh, today and the next couple days. It appears that the scripture of the day on Sunday was Romans 12. <laughs> the discernment team led out with that, uh, with a lengthy reading, and then members of Greenwich, I think it was three uh, members, different members, cited portions of Romans chapter 12 uh, in their own remarks. Uh, my recollection is, I need to go back and see the, um, watch the video. It is posted, by the way, so it's up on the church website. Hopefully you can watch that if you weren't able to attend. Romans 12, I'll, I'll skip around a little bit, but Romans 12 begins this way about urging you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And so I think here's where folks at Greenwich were dialing in. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so this call to discernment and testing and proving the will of God by not conforming to the pattern of the world, and I believe the concern being raised by Greenwich folks was that the PCUSA is 
beginning to, in, in places, conform to the world with its understanding of human sexuality and gender identity. Again, I'm not putting words in the mouth of Granite Strokes, but I believe some of this is what was implied or, or being uh, spoken towards. Um, it, it, Paul goes on from there, and again, the reading of Romans 12 that our, our uh, discernment team talked about the unity of the body. Ironically, or interestingly, I was going to preach from Romans 12. I, I shifted to the parallel passage in 1 Corinthians 12 because I think it was just a little more clearer about the, the one body and many members. But, but Paul writes that here. And again, it's his same understanding about the, the body of Christ. Just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. So that unity of the body. And so I heard that in the concern expressed or the, in the reading of it by the discernment team uh, members. Let's remember the unity of the body, though we are different, which of course was the theme I was preaching on uh, Sunday morning. Just jump forward a little bit into Romans 12, verse 9. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one another above yourselves. And so this theme of, of the manner in which we relate to one another in the body of Christ. Paul's writing in the context of the Jew-Gentile controversy and how difficult it was for Jew and Gentile ancient enemies to come to table together, to be in fellowship together. We, we're struggling in a different context. Ours is the context of some theological differences. There were deeply embedded cultural, ethnic differences, right? But the struggle is the same, to honor fellow Christians. Um, Paul goes on, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. So the sympathy and compassion we have, the endurance we have, the, 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 we don't retaliate, live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not repay anyone for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Again, this call to live in a certain manner within the body of Christ across the differences, culture, ethnicity, custom, theological conviction. And, and this is hard, okay? This is graduate level discipleship. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Let me encourage you to read the whole chapter of Romans 12. It was the scripture of the day, okay? And, and so what might God be saying to us that, that, that independent individuals or this team all came to Romans 12. Now, there were other scriptures lifted up, but, but Romans 12 showed up and could have shown up one more time and should have. So I apologize for robbing us of being able to hear Romans 12 in the morning. What might God be saying through Romans about conformity to the world or not, right? So I think there's some uh, thoughtful expressions as Greenwich members were lifting up. The unity of the body and making sure we do live at peace and not dishonor one another, though we have these differences. Again, so proud of how the meeting went. But I wonder how open we are to hear the fullness of what God may be speaking out of Romans 12. You know, when we cite a portion of Scripture or a passage of Scripture, we're, we're choosing it for a reason. And we have in our minds what the application of that passage is. So do not be conformed to the pattern of the world. The world is teaching certain things about gender identity, sexual orientation, and the like. Do not conform to that. But, but the world also bids us to conform in other ways. If you don't like somebody, cut them off. If you don't like somebody, cancel them. The world also does that, right? No, 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 that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about sexual orientation, gender identity, and let's, let's keep marriage between one man and one woman. I agree. But how open are we to hearing 
God's voice through Romans 12 about not conforming to the pattern of the world and making sure we don't conform to a pattern of the world that we're not a, we're not aware we're doing that because we live in a cancel culture we live in a world that if you don't agree with me or I don't agree with you I cut you off I cut you out I no longer associate with you now I'm not arguing that we stay in the peace USA okay this is don't, don't hear that I'm arguing for graduate level discipleship and let's how willing are we to hear yeah, let's not conform to the pattern of the world so we can't be in the peace USA anymore because I think that message came through clearly. There are some who very clearly, in no uncertain terms, we must no longer be associated with the peace USA in any form. Yes, we may be brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll see you in heaven. But on earth, we want nothing to, more to do with you. I think that message came through. Uh, maybe a little stronger in a couple places than I would have articulated. But nonetheless, I, I'm thankful for those who, who spoke and, and spoke passionately. So my concern is, are, are, are the people who are citing Romans 12 or saying we have to you know, be done with the Peace USA also willing to hear the word of God about the unity of the body and the differences we have and honoring one another above ourselves. Again, what we're dealing with is nothing compared to the Jew-Gentile struggle, okay? So, so that was really deep, deep, you know, uh, hatred and, and animosity. Now, there's an implied concern. I want to kind of wrap up here. An implied concern in, in what I heard, and not just on Sunday. I've, I've heard this, and I've spoken it myself at some level over these last uh, couple of years, there's an implied concern of guilt by association. If we remain affiliated in any measure, in any way, with the Peace USA, we are somehow going to be guilty of the sins that we are accusing the Peace USA of, the, 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 the faults um, and the shortcomings, uh, the concerns that we have are being lifted up. There are some of them theological concerns. Some of them are priority missional concerns, you know, the dismantling heteropatriarchy and social justice narratives that I'm not sure are what scripture is calling us to do. So it's not just a theological interpretive concern. Sometimes it's an emphasis and a practical missional concern of what the church is really supposed to be about. Are we trying to dismantle structures and systems? And, and who, who says what these systems are, how can we identify them, all that. <clears throat> and so there's an implied guilt by association. If we somehow stay connected to the Peace USA at all, we're somehow guilty, and that guilt then accrues to us, and I don't want that, okay? Now, there's a positive, uh, there's an upside and a downside to, to such thinking. Again, nobody said those words, and forgive me if you're fe feeling like I'm impugning your motives if you were one of the ones who spoke or thinks we you know we need to be completely away but let me let me just tease some thoughts out there's a positive expression of this and i think it comes from the beatitudes the hunger and thirst for righteousness uh the blessed are the pure in heart right there is such a thing of hungering and thirsting for righteousness right right relationships right relationships to god right relationships to truth, right relationships to our neighbors, and we can be unrightly related, right? And so, so this is good. I, I commend those who, who wish to know the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, the purity of heart. I wish to be in fellowships and in communities and in relationship with communities that are seeking to honor God. And we struggle when we feel like I'm now part of an organization or a community or a church or a denomination that, in my estimation, is not honoring God in X, Y, or Z manner. And so now we come to the, the, the flip side of this kind of guilt by association. There's a hunger and thirst for righteousness that is commendable. The flip side of that is we must be very careful lest we fall into the sin of the Pharisees the Pharisees, their, their very name means separated ones, the pure ones. They're the ones who, 
during the time between the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the closing out, and the, 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 the prophets no longer speaking, and then you know, we get the, the, the advent of the New Testament, John the Baptist, you know, the birth of Jesus, all this. In that 400 years, the Pharisees grow up, and they are the ones who are seeking to protect and preserve pure worship and the Torah and the law of Moses and the traditions that then develop so that when Jesus shows up and he starts to heal on the Sabbath, they are, you know, they're, they're just furious. He violates the traditions. He is, he is breaking the Sabbath. And he says, hey, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You guys have got it all wrong. In their zeal for righteousness, they became unrighteous. Jesus meets with the tax collectors and sinners, the lost sheep of Israel. He's trying to call them home and win them back because the Pharisees have cut them off. That The Pharisees are separated from the riffraff. And so they are clucking their tongues. Why does this man eat with tax collectors and sinners? And so the sin of the Pharisees is to focus on the sins of others, which is why Jesus told that parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. And the tax collector and the Pharisee go up to the temple to pray. And, and there's the Pharisee saying, thank God I'm not like other men. And the poor tax collector is just back there. God have mercy on me, a sinner. We must be careful in this work of realignment of how we think about others, how we think about the institution, the people we don't know. Now you've met seven or six individuals from the Presbytery on this team. We must be very careful how we view these friends and the friends we don't know who are sisters and brothers in Christ that we not become haughty like the Pharisees. This is the downside of this concern for my association and kind of the guilt I perceive myself uh, participating in by association with this community. Again, there's the positive, hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm all in for that. Be careful about the, the sin of the, the Pharisee. The logic taken to an extreme would make it very difficult to participate in this world as a Christian. And this is where the Pharisees struggled, right? Because they couldn't have any commerce with Gentiles. So when they're trying to get Jesus handed over to Pilate, you know, they don't want to even go into that palace because that's Gentile space. And if I go into Gentile space, I'll be unclean and I won't be able to celebrate the Passover. So they're trying to find a way to avoid this ceremonial uncleanness. So in their desire for righteousness, here they are turning Jesus over, <laughs> right? But, you know, we're going to have nothing to do with those Gentiles. The logic then extended in our own situation would say, you know, the United States of America, the taxes that we pay do support some things that as Christians or Christians who view the scripture a certain way as we do should have some troubles with, right? And maybe that's why we're so kept up on our politics, right? We want to change the political universe. But if you've got your money invested in the stock market, Mm, you know, that stock market, woo, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of companies who are doing some shady business, right, in, in places and doing things. Well, yeah, 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 but, but you know, so it, be careful of guilt by association thinking because, you know, where do you stop that? And, and so I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a case for or against the PCUSA. I'm trying to make the case of our heart. So Romans 12 is the scripture of the day. Let's read Romans 12. Let's open ourselves up to all that God may want to speak to us through Romans 12, not just selective applications of Romans 12. Do not be conformed to the pattern of the world and only selected groups who that speaks to. That if, if we're not to be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that, reply, that applies to all of us, not just people in the Peace USA, but to me. Well, I'm in the Peace USA, I guess, technically. But it applies to all of us. So let's be careful, okay? So anyway, I just was struck. That's the first thing. It was like, man, that scripture showed up. But are we just trying to selectively apply Romans 12 in a way that makes us look good and makes them look bad? Let's not do that, okay? 
let us open ourselves up to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, even if it calls us to engagements and participations that we're uncomfortable with. God knows our consciences. God knows the secret sins and iniquities of our hearts, right? And he forgives us. So if we are, in fact, guilty, we have true moral guilt by association with the Presbyterian Church USA, we must trust that God will forgive us through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. But we must be careful lest we impugn certain kinds of activities or actions or statements and somehow because others believe that, that somehow that taints me. I, I don't believe that to be true. This is why we have these kind of conversations to differentiate ourselves and to challenge ourselves and then to listen well. So anyway, I'll stop there and we'll pick up tomorrow and a few more observations. Let's pray. So Father, thank you for the mercies that are, that are shown to us. And we join in, in continuing our prayers uh, through our, our prayer guide that a Christ-centered and spirit-guided metanoia would take place among all parties involved in the discernment process. Lord, hear our prayer. And God, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that understand. Give that to the discernment team, to the session, to the Greenwich Church family, especially as we have heard repeated references to your word in Romans 12. And Father, may, may, may Jesus be glorified. Jesus Christ be glorified. May the name of God honored. And may the unity of the Spirit preserved at every step of this journey. Lord, hear our prayers. We make it in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God give you that heart for his righteousness. May he give you the humility of the tax collector. And may you be transformed by the renewing of your mind this day and forevermore. Amen.